to double check with H on that. I believe that she has had a number of consultations, even though she has not uh, formally testified on, on that subject. And her uh, resignation was, of course, dated back to July 24th, and it's something that she had told some of us that was was in the process. So I think that that was known around the building. Um, but I will confirm what uh, excuse me what discussions she's had. But I do believe that she has been in touch with many senators without having formally formal, appeared before the uh, committee. But formal testimony is a very important part of oversight. Sure. Um, there have been numerous reports, credible reports, mm -hmm. that Steve Miller and his demands regarding immigration and Guatemala in particular, but mm -hmm. other issues, had a role in her decision to spend more time with her family. Yeah, I, so I talked to Kim about that. She's addressed it, that with me directly. Uh, she said there's absolutely no truth uh, to that. Uh, the Washington Post reported that there was an email from Stephen Miller. Um, she's denied ever seeing this email. Um, I know that she's consulted with other people in the White House. I'll let them speak for themselves, but I believe that they would offer also offer uh, similar denials. Um, and, you know, Kim has been here 27 months. It's uh, I know I've been on two trips with her already in the four and a half months that I've been here. It's demanding. It's really grueling. And um, I think, unfortunately, we're, we are losing one of the best and brightest that we have that she's moving on. But um, I think that she has indicated to everyone and, and to me personally, I've spoken to her multiple times over the past few days, that this is something that she had planned in the works for, for several months now. Was, she felt like it was time for her to move on. I mean, it's at a critical time and sure. assistant secretary positions are vacant or are acting and number of key regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, I think Kim was left hanging in the Senate for many months. I don't remember the exact number of months, but in the two years that she was here, she spent probably way longer uh, waiting in the Senate for confirmation than she should have spent. But concerns about the numbers mm -hmm. of vacancies, I know Secretary Kim Pompeo came and mm -hmm. tried uh, to fill a lot of these positions. He did, that had yeah, been he's been aggressive. Now we've got policy planning, obviously we've got mm -hmm. assistant secretaries in key regions, actings and others. Um, how do you fill these gaps? I think that, well, first of all, there's uh, 69,000, I think, amazing people that work around the world for the State Department. I, I've been lucky on several occasions to serve at two U.S. embassies with, uh, I think, some of the best and brightest diplomats around the world, and it's an honor to work with them, and it's an honor to speak for them uh, here whenever I do brief at this podium. I think, I'm sure that the Secretary will have some personnel announcements. They'll want to find the, the right people to, to step up in, in either acting roles or to fill these vacancies, and it's something that I think he has been very uh, attuned to um, in the little more than a year that he's been secretaries of state and killing these, uh, filling these key positions. Hey, Leslie. Hello, Morgan. Um, a quick thing that is a breaking news story that oh. I just wanted to ask you about. Okay. Um, are you aware of the French inviting President Rouhani to the G7? I, ha I had heard rumors about that yesterday. Yep. And um, is it true? I don't think it's true. We'll need to confirm for you, but as far as I, as far as I'm heard, it's rumors. I don't know why he would be invited. But I mean, we'll confirm. Okay. We'll confirm, but I believe those are just rumors. Okay. Um, uh, well, is that something that you think that the secretary and even the president would welcome? Well, I think that the I think that the president and the secretary um, have said that they're willing on multiple occasions to uh, to negotiate to talk to Iran without preconditions, uh, that offer remains on, on the table. Um, whenever, uh, whenever the Ayatollah and whenever Rouhani, the people that are actually in charge of that government, want to speak, we'll be there to listen. And then I just have a follow-up on sure. something else that I wanted to uh, talk to you about. Was, um, there was a letter today from uh, Nita Lawi um, regarding the money that um, uh, th there's a temporary freeze um, on some key foreign aid funds. Is this the OMB? That's correct. Yeah. Um, the question is, has the, has the State Department um, actually uh, provided the OMB with any details or response to the letter? That okay. process is ongoing. I don't know that our response is finalized. Um, in speaking with the department, OMB's call for this data and information that you referred to is the first step uh, in, some, in a process, of course, to determine how best uh, to spend foreign assistance funds. Um, and so I have not seen the letter from, uh, from Nita Lilly, but, but again, this is the first step. And we will, of course, comply and provide the data and information that OMB requires of us. Okay, but that hasn't happened yet. I don't know that it's finalized. I'm okay. sure that we're in the process. We can certainly confirm when, when that is finalized. But again, this is just the first Thank you. Uh, step in the process. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Good to see you. 
Um, the Chinese Foreign Ministry's office in Hong Kong has issued a formal protest over a reported meeting between U.S. consular officials in the city and opposition figures. Mm -hmm. The statement demanded the U.S. explain the purpose of the meeting and, uh, quote, immediately cease interfering in Hong Kong's affairs. Do you have anything on that meeting and in reaction to the How did you statement? characterize the first sentence? Can you say that again? It was the Chinese Foreign Ministry uh -huh. office in Hong Kong. Uh, but, how, but what did you say that, that they issued a, you said, read your first statement again. A formal protest? Yeah. I don't think that, that leaking an American diplomat's uh, private information, pictures, names of their children, I don't think that that's a formal protest. That is what a thuggish regime would do. That's not how a responsible nation would, would behave. Um, releasing any of that personal information of an American diplomat is completely unacceptable. That's not a protest. That's what a thuggish regime does, and it's unacceptable. Thank you. Well, we're going to address the reason for the thuggishness, which is the, a, a meeting between a, a consul, yeah, this consular is what, this official. Is what it, and, sure, I understand the question. This is what American diplomats yeah. do every single day around the world. American diplomats meet with, with formal government officials, we meet with opposition protesters, uh, not just in Hong Kong or China. I mean, it literally happens in every single country in which an American embassy is present. So our uh, diplomat was doing her job, um, and we commend her for her work. So you don't buy the Chinese argument that because Hong Kong is part of China, even though it's run differently, that, that this is interference in, in their internal Internal this, affairs. This is what not only this, American diplomats do. This, this right. is what other countries do. The secretary met do. with opposition people in he Australia, did. did he not? In Australia? Or in Thailand or on his recent trip? I, no? I was in almost every meeting and I don't recall that happening. Okay. I can I can double check to make sure I didn't miss something, but um, I don't I, I was not in a meeting <coughs> with opposition figures. And the last thing right. yeah. are, you are you saying there was no formal protest at all? There was just this leaking of photographs and uh, I don't. I don't know if there was a formal protest. My point is, is that I'm I'm taking issue with uh, the Chinese saying they issued a formal protest when, in fact, they harassed an American diplomat. So, are you saying that, that are you, to put a finer point on it, that, sure. the, that the Chinese government behaved thuggishly? Are you calling? I think them I said that three behavior? times. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. On the agreement with Turkey that you mentioned at the top. Yes, ma'am. An embassy statement said there will be a peace corridor and displaced Syrians will go there. You didn't mention that, and neither did the Pentagon in its statement. So yeah. the question, will displaced Syrians be brought into the area? And if so, will you ensure that there's no major demographic, demographic shift and no creation of a Democrat, demographic corridor that separates the Kurds in Syria from the Kurds in Turkey? So the so you know, the first part I checked with the or I had a member of my team I should say check with the with the Pentagon because I know that they gave you an answer um, to uh, to one of your questions and and I believe that the that the DoD maybe just left off a sentence and didn't, didn't give you the the full response so I mean I think that we have the full statement that's posted on the Embassy Ankara website. I believe the DoD also has it posted as well, and we can certainly our team can make sure that that you have a co copy of the full. Um, statement. And what else was it that you needed from me? I'm sorry. That, uh, will there be the movement of Syrian refugees in Turkey into that oh. area, and will you ensure that doesn't result in a big demographic shift? So it's the U.S. position um, that we do not support any sort of forced or, co or coerced uh, relocations of refugees or IDPs if and when conditions allow any refugee who, who wants to return to their destination, it must be of their own choosing, it must be voluntary, safe, and dignified. Will these be Syrians who lived in that area, or any Syrian can go there? Because 3.6 mm -hmm. million Syrians if, uh, absolutely would change the demography of that area. It certainly would, and I think that any sort of uh, discussions um, in, in fine detail on the safe zone are, are still ongoing. I think that we were certainly encouraged that the U.S. and Turkey issued a joint statement on something that um, the United States government has been working very diligently with our NATO ally, Turkey, on. And I, I don't think I have any details beyond that. Okay? Hey. Hey, thanks, Morgan. Um, do you have a status update on the CATSA sanctions for Turkey's purchase of the S-400? No. And can you say whether the recent Taliban claimed violence has had any role in the ongoing discussions in Doha between the U.S. and the Taliban? Yeah, you're referring to the attack yesterday, yeah. I assume. Yeah, I mean, listen, the attack yesterday or any of these attacks are appalling. I mean, they're totally 
disgusting and on every level. We think that the cost of war, um, especially in Afghanistan, is too high and the violence needs to end. And that is principally why Ambassador Khalil Azad uh, has spent so much time trying to get to a peace deal because uh, we, we want to get to peace. We want the Afghan people to be able to choose their own destiny, uh, to, to be able to choose their own government, um, and we want the war to end. But can you say whether they've warned the negotiators in Doha that this is unacceptable, whether there would be any consequences for this? Did action? the negotiators warn the Taliban? Is that the question? Yeah, or just has there been any message from the U.S. directly to the Taliban to that effect? I don't want to put any words in Zal's mouth, so I'd certainly need to speak to him. But I can tell you that anybody who's representing the U.S. government is certainly going to um, condemn both publicly and privately attacks on innocent civilians. And just one Did final you have, oh, question. Sorry. Can you confirm that Matthew Gabbert has been placed on leave? the accused um, official involved with white supremacy? Uh, yeah, um, I am not uh, able to confirm anything from this podium. Well, it's a quick follow-up. Like Afghanistan? Follow attack, yeah, on uh -huh. Afghanistan. The secretary 10 days or so ago mm -hmm. uh, in the interview with David Rubenstein said right. that the president had directed him to, to mm -hmm. uh, prepare for the withdrawal of troop, U.S. troops by mm -hmm. the end of his first term. And I think he said in a follow-up answer, at that breakfast. Well, I think the way, if I may interject, I yeah, think the way David asked the question uh, was, would it be by the end of 2020? And I think what the Secretary said was that the, those were the President's mm -hmm. orders to me, and mm -hmm. he said that he thought it would be job enhancing to complete, to meet that. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that the President has made that complete clear since he began campaigning and I'm just wondering whether this Kabul attack. It um, always complicates. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's complicating. Um, and, it, and it certainly makes our job uh, tougher. Um, but you know, at the same time, this is why we have uh, this is why we have Ambassador Khalil Azad and some of the best people in the business trying to bring all sides to the table. And you know, it's not just a. I think we spend a lot of time focusing on the negotiations that we have with the Taliban, but we're also equally incredibly focused on inter-Afghan dialogue. I was with the Secretary in Kabul. Uh, not long ago, when we were meeting with um, leaders of uh, leaders of their parliament, we met with uh, we met with women, we met with people in education and activists, um, and he had the same message, you know, which was, of course, we want all people and all parties to be brought to the table. And I think um, many of you know that my personal history with Afghanistan and my own personal commitment to, to seeing peace there. And, and we've talked from this podium. I think the last time I was here about the number of people, even on my team, who have spouses serving in. Afghanistan right now. And so this is something that uh, I think incredibly personal to all of us. It's incredibly personal to the American people. We're 18, 19 years in. We have young men and women who were born after 9-11 who are being uh, sent over there to fight. And I think if, if the last 20 years has taught us anything, um, it's that the president is correct that we need to try to pursue peace in Afghanistan, and that's the goal that we're working towards. Could you, sorry, Morgan, did you just, I, I didn't realize you had personal experience in Afghanistan, but anyway, could you just explain why it was that you weren't able to ask, a, answer the question of Which one? The, the, the person being put on suspension or leave, just the explanation as to why? You uh, said, I'm not able to confirm anything from this podium. Why is it, why is that? I, we're not, we just are not able to co confirm suspensions from this podium. Well, we Ahead, ask you about climate change in light of the, another UN mm -hmm. report. Um, when the secretary was in Micronesia, he said that one of the things that uh, he tries to do, or we all can do, is help nations lower their carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. Is that something that he, you've seen him brought, bring up in meetings with counterparts? Mm -hmm. He was with China last week. Mm -hmm. Did he urge the Chinese foreign minister to, to lower their emissions? We covered a number of issues in China. Um, I believe we sent a readout uh, on the on the meeting, yeah, and, and I don't mentioned. think that we had that mentioned specifically there. But I've definitely been in, in meetings with them where we've discussed this, and I think that he said to many of you who have asked him this question, he's quoted the um, emissions, the United States United States emissions drop at 13 percent from 2005 to 2019, and this of course was at a time when our economy was growing by. 19 percent. And I think the one thing that the Secretary has always stressed, especially coming from the private sector, that, that he thinks one of the reasons why the United States has able to make such significant uh, gains uh, in, in reducing emissions is because of private sector-led innovation. And that's certainly something that he that he champions and talks about. On that statistic, though, the mm -hmm. uh, Energy Information Administration, part of the U.S. government, reported that in 2018, emissions actually rose 2.7 percent. 
So is there any sort of concern that the U.S. is actually heading in the wrong direction now in terms of carbon dioxide emissions? Well, I mean, if you look at the EIA forecast, they say that uh, CO2 emissions will decline by 2.3 percent in 2019. Um, and so that's certainly a target that we uh, hope to hit. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can I ask a few questions on India and Pakistan? I don't know that I'm going to go much um, Okay, you know, beyond our formal statements that we said, but you have certainly may yeah. ask. So do you have a readout of Ambassador Wells' meeting in Pakistan, who all seen that, and what were the issues to be discussed? You know, I spoke to her uh, maybe about an hour ago, and we didn't have a great connection, so I don't have a readout yet, but um, I'll certainly talk to her team. We announced her, um, I believe I announced her travel here uh, from the podium. I think we also sent out a media note. Um, but we will make sure to, to follow up with you. Maybe we could even have you meet with her when, when she gets back for a readout. I've certainly been trying to yeah. open up and get all, all, all of you more access to our officials here at the State Department. Thank you for doing yeah. that. After Monday's mm -hmm. decision on Kashmir by India and mm -hmm. Prime Minister Imran Khan's speech in, in his own parliament, has Secretary Pompeo reached out to his counterparts in India and Pakistan? So we had a meeting, of course, um, with uh, Jashankar in ASEAN. And um, I need to, I know that he has had a number of phone calls. I don't know which ones we've released publicly. But yes, I mean, he, um, he speaks with his counterparts on a daily basis. And as Matt so did my job for me and pointed out how many uh, State Department officials we have in the region, we have a lot of engagement. But listen, we have a lot of engagement with India and Pakistan. Obviously, we just had Prime Minister Khan here, not just because of Kashmir. That's certainly an incredibly important issue and something that we follow <coughs> closely. Um, but we have uh, a host of issues that we work uh, with India on quite closely and that we work with Pakistan on, uh, on quite closely. I would say that we are, uh, as a State Department, we are incredibly engaged in Southeast Asia. Has there been any change in U.S. policy on Kashmir? No. There's no change on it? No. Nope. Uh, and if there was, I certainly wouldn't be announcing it here, but no, there's not. <laughs> yeah. Why not? All of Kashmir, please. Because we let someone more important like the President do that. So uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan is calling it a genocide in mm -hmm. Kashmir. Does the U.S. see any human rights violation even or no? Uh, yeah, I mean, I really don't want to go beyond what we said because it's such a um, – it's such a tenuous, you know, issue. It's something that we're talking to them about quite closely. We obviously, whenever it comes to, uh, whenever it comes to any region in the world where there are tensions, we ask for people to observe the rule of law, uh, to respect for human rights, respect for international norms. Uh, we ask people to maintain peace and security and and direct dialogue. Um, there are reports, uh, as you've mentioned, of detentions and restrictions of residents in uh, Jammu and in Kashmir. And uh, again, that's why we continue to monitor this very, very closely. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Morgan. Yeah. Uh, two questions for, uh, on the South Korea. Okay. Uh, first question is, uh, President Trump said yesterday uh, the South Korea agreed with increase of... The, the President said what? I'm sorry? The president said yesterday the South Korea agreed oh, with the yeah. uh, increase of defense cost sharing. Mm -hmm. Is there a smooth negotiation with the South Korea or uh, he just is saying so because of uh, uh, South Korean government said that the negotiation is not starting yet. So right. I want to know about that. Second oh. question is sure. the uh, Defense Secretary uh, Esper uh, has mentioned recently the United States are mm -hmm. deploying a um, medium-range medium missiles <laughs> in uh, Korea, Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, other Asian mm -hmm. countries. Can you complement it? So I'll start with Esper. I mean, I would defer you to uh, the Department of Defense and to, and to Secretary Esper to clarify uh, his comments for anything that you may need there. We certainly don't want to speak on, on behalf of them. I mean, listen, when it comes to um, U.S. bases in, in South Korea and those agreements, this is one of those issues that the president has been incredibly crystal clear on, right? There's no ambiguity in where the president stands. He wants <laughs> He said that he wants our allies to contribute more. It's certainly uh, a reoccurring theme. Um, we're also, I, I would say that we are in, uh, here at the State Department, we're of course very appreciative of the considerable resources that South Korea uh, has provided to support the alliance. Uh, South Korea is 
uh, one of our most crucial allies in Northeast Asia. They will remain so. Um, and they, of course, contributed towards the cost of maintaining U.S. presence, U.S. forces in South Korea. Um, but of course, this is something, burden sharing is a theme of the President's, and it will be a theme of the President's as it relates to South Korea, as it relates to NATO, um, you know, pick your, pick your issue. The President wants all countries to, to share in the mutual defense. Hi. Uh, I have two questions in regards to Iran, uh, with the designation of uh, Mrs. Zarif uh, by the Treasury. Uh, does it pro prohibition on providing services to Mr. Zarif includes barring his access to the U.S. social media, including his access to Twitter and Instagram? I think he's still tweeting. Pretty sure you can. I mean, it's too bad the Iranians can't tweet, the Iranian people, but yeah, he's still tweeting. Okay, and the second one is that uh, you mentioned that there is a precondition still on the table with the negotiation with the Iranian. No, official. I said there's no preconditions. I'm sorry, no precondition yeah. on the table. Um, um, does that, with the Mr. Zarif out of the picture, with the designation, uh, so um, who the U.S. administration prefers to do the talking with? I don't think that we have said that we must talk to person X or per person Y in the regime. I mean, our request, uh, you know, to the Ayatollah and to uh, Rouhani is um, to, for their country, for them to think very carefully about how they've terrorized the region and to consider stop doing so. And if they want to talk about uh, how they can behave like a normal nation, they know, and how they can be brought back into the world uh, um, and have sanctions removed, they know exactly who they can call, and that's President Trump, and he's waiting on their phone call. Uh, also, um, any update on the Maritime uh, Security Initiative? Uh, what is the latest? Yeah, we had an update yesterday. I don't know if you saw the press conference um, with the new uh, British Foreign Minister in which they announced their participation as well. I think we're, um, we, this is also led by, uh, by DOD, and so I'm not going to get ahead of any announcements, but I think we've had over 60 countries that have been in meetings and consultations and, and, and participation, and we will, uh, I think we will continue to, to give updates and, and, and provide um, which countries are participating uh, on a routine basis. Can you stand Thank around for one second? Please? Sure. Um, Michelle? Is it yeah, Michelle? Uh, yeah, that's me. Yeah. Um, the Princeton um, graduate student, Shui Wong, marked three years now in um, prison in Iran. Mm -hmm. And his wife was here in Washington today asking the Trump administration to do more, um, pointing out <coughs> that, the, you know, the U.S. sent its hostage negotiator to Sweden mm -hmm. to get Rocky, ASAP Rocky out. Um, what more is uh, this administration doing on behalf of yeah, the American implication there is that if we're working to help one hostage, that we can't help to work another, and we can walk and chew gum. Uh, Robert O'Brien is a close friend of mine, someone I've known for years. I know that he is working diligently behind the scenes. I think this administration has one of the most successful records in getting American hostages released. Uh, Robert is constantly traveling uh, and negotiating, working with his countries, and this is something that's very personal to him to get our American hostages back. It's something that's incredibly personal um, to the Secretary and, of course, to the President, and that's why we have such a great track record of doing so, and we are going to continue every day that we all draw breath here at the State Department to fight for our Americans to get them, to get our American hostages back. Mr. Morgan, are you saying mm -hmm. by that answer that you, the administration considered ASAP Rocky to be a hostage oh. held by Sweden? No, that's, thank you for clarifying that. Um, uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, Robert is the head of hostage negotiations here, but he was working with, uh, within the consular affairs in right. those negotiations because he was already met. We can walk and chew gum at the same time, and we can, in yep. other words, we can work to free one hostage. She specifically mentioned this guy in Sweden. Right. And the, so right. you're not trying to say that the no. Swedes were holding him hostage. No, we're not. No, no, sorry for implying that. Thank you're you. right. Thank you. Why was it appropriate to be in Sweden when the Prime Minister had very specifically said mm -hmm. that their system of laws is that the Prime Minister does not interfere with their judicial system? Mm -hmm. I mean, wasn't it offensive? for the hostage negotiator who has a very specific mission mm -hmm. to show up in Sweden. I think it's appropriate that he went because the president sent him. Well, that doesn't make it appropriate. Can I ask yeah. a follow-up on your own? Uh, from Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, President. Are you uh, not going to ask me about Kashmir again, are you? Because uh, I'm done with that. Okay, okay, okay. So let's go to Afghanistan. Okay. So so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After meeting, yes. uh, President Trump, Prime Minister Imran Khan invited Taliban delegation uh, to, to talk about the peace agreement between Taliban and the Afghan government. Who invited the Taliban? 
Prime Minister Imran Khan. Oh, Khan. Thank uh, you. So I thought how, you said President Trump. Yeah. Thought, so how do you uh, see this progress uh, connecting Taliban with the Afghan government? Um, I don't think that I have uh, anything additional really to, to go beyond what I've already said. I think we've talked about Afghanistan quite a bit. Uh, but I w would say that obviously um, the Prime Minister Khan is going to be incredibly crucial in uh, helping us with these, with this peace deal and with this uh, peace negotiation <coughs> that continues. Um, and I think when he was here in Washington, the President and the Secretary alluded to that as well as how, how important that relationship will be in helping us pursue peace in Afghanistan. It's certainly um, it's not a bilateral issue between the U.S. and Afghanistan. It certainly affects <coughs> us, but it affects our NATO allies who are there with us. It affects India. It affects Pakistan. It, affects Russia and China. It's something that affects many nations uh, in the world, and that's why I think you see Zal traveling so much and working diligently. It, I think we'll do last question with Nick. Um, yesterday, Zarif, this is Iran again, Zarif, okay. Zarif, Zarif said that, um, that if, if Iran doesn't see more commitment from the Europeans mm -hmm. to um, give it the benefits of the JCPOA that it would um, violate he says additional that a lot. terms of yeah. the nuclear deal. So I'm wondering what this means for uh, the decision to keep extending nuclear waivers, you mm -hmm. know, waivers for the civil nuclear program. Would would successive violations by Iran cause the U.S. to mm -hmm. reconsider the decision to grant those waivers? I don't know that those those two things are ultimately connected the way that you just connected them. So I'll take the first part of, of what you said. I mean, listen, if the um, European – we're not a part of the JCPOA, obviously. We withdrew. So if the Europeans want to be uh, held hostage by the threats uh, from Iran as it relates to the deal, that's, that's their business um, to do so. Uh, as it relates to the nuclear waivers um, and their extensions, um, I believe they were extended for another 90 days, and that's a decision um, that the Secretary and the President made together. And um, if there is another extension in 90 days, we'll certainly let you know. And can I just one follow up on the, on Instex? Only Sorry. because I like you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> on, on German media is reporting that the the German former diplomat who's been tasked with running Instex from their side mm -hmm. has been. I haven't seen this. Yeah. Has been pushed out because of some anti-Semitic comments he made well, in that would be uh, bad. YouTube. I'm just wondering um, what your current attitude is toward Instex. Do you see this as a viable uh, conduit for humanitarian financial transactions, or would you rather mm -hmm. that countries, Germany, for example, were stay you with away from us in States? Germany on that trip? I thought you were. Were you with us? Uh, which I don't one? Think so. I, I, so I think, and we'll have to look this up. I think the last time the secretary was asked this was at his press avail. Uh, right. with the German Foreign Minister at Mass, um, uh, in which he spoke and said uh, at, at the time when he was asked about it, and again, he could have addressed this recently. I will certainly double check. My recollection, the last time he was asked about this, he, he was uh, uh, very forthright and said, you know, if, if there are trades that, if, excuse me, if there are goods uh, that are not sanctioned um, that are being used in that facility, then he's supportive of it. And we can certainly pull the exact language um, that he used from that just, press just conference with Prime Minister Moss. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. I'll see you. Uh, I'm, I may be on reserve duty next week, so I may not be here, but I will confirm with all of you and let you know. So if I'm not here, I will brief um, as soon as I'm back. Thank you. Thank you.